All right, we have one more talk before we take our cocktail break. I'd like to welcome Beth to the stage. Uh, you guys have heard Beth tell many a tale before, and here she is to tell a story of archaeological fraud and a little bit of personal art mischief. Please welcome Beth. Holy crap, what an act to follow. Damn, Misha. <laughs> Sorry, Baron. My apologies. <laughs> okay, so first of all, who really enjoys a nice old-fashioned shot of Schadenfreude? And who really enjoys some good old-fashioned shenanigans? Excellent, my people. Okay, I have got a story for you, and it begins with a book that came out right around the same time that Mary Toft was popping out rabbit parts. The uh, Lithography Versa Burgensis, and it took me a long time to figure out how to say that, was published in 1726, and it chronicled the discovery of approximately 2,000 mysterious stones uh, that were found on and around Mount Eibelstadt in the district of Würzburg in the German state of Bavaria. The stones bore images in bas relief, and uh, the author of the book included a lot of his own uh, illustrations. There were spiders with intact webs and birds with feathers and flowers and scaled fish and fornicating amphibians and insects. <laughs> there were even astronomical bodies radiating light. And the frontispiece for this book depicted an idealized image of Mount Eibelstadt covered with the stones and heavenly beings. And they were heavenly because the author of this book believed that these stones were proof of the divine. Johann Bartholomew Adam Berenger was dean of the faculty of medicine as well as chief physician to the Prince Bishop of Würzburg. And despite that lofty status, or maybe partially because of it, he was not particularly well liked or respected by his colleagues. Uh, they considered him pompous and pedantic and insufferably pious. And it really seems the only people who did respect him were within religious circles. And uh, <laughs> he believed that fossils were God's own artwork created by the creator for his own amusement. And, you know, we don't need to go there that there are people today that kind of maybe sort of think the same thing. Actually, this website in itself is a hoax. It's very funny. I will post the link on uh, the something weird uh, page, but um, <laughs> there are people today, uh, the young earthers, for example, who are staunch creationists who do not believe that fossils exist. And uh, Berenger was one of these people. And although he was fond of looking at fossils, what he was really fascinated by was stones that looked like other things, kind of like cloud gazing. You know, where he'd pick up a rock and be like, oh, look, it looks just like a bunny. Maybe Mary Toft gave birth to this. <laughs> so how, he, you know, despite the fact that he did go looking for these fossils, the first few were actually delivered to him by some boys who said that they'd found them on Mount Eibelstadt. And over the next six months or so, more of them... Why are we not advancing here? There we go. Uh, more of the stones over the next three months were delivered to him. Anetta, I am pushing down. There we go. Okay, I know I was pushing down. I swear to God. 
So over the next six months, they discovered more and more of these stones, and some of them even had Hebrew inscribed upon them, including one that said Jehovah. <laughs> so believing that these stones were irrefutable proof of God, Berenger decided that it was also irrefutable irrefutable proof that he was brilliant and deserved to be well compensated for his intelligence, so he wrote and published his book. And shortly after it was released, he found another stone, so the legend says, that had his name on it. <laughs> and <laughs> yes, he was legit. And it was actually at that point that he realized that he had been the butt of an academic joke. I don't know why I'm having such a hard time with this. So whether there really was a stone with his name on it or not is unproven. However, it was proven that J. Ignatz Roderick, who was the professor of geography and mathematics, and Johann Georg von Eckhart, who was a counselor and the university librarian, were both identified as the perpetrators. They had hand carved and planted all 2,000 stones <laughs> right where they knew Beringer and his students would find them. Now, initially, they denied it. They even tried to bribe somebody to take credit for it. And many people believed that they never even thought that he'd fall for it. But there was no denying their delight at how far he had fallen for it and how far he had fallen off his high horse because this guy, he had it coming. I mean, he was such an ass and he'd been walking around with a big old kick me sign on his back for years. And the university, the faculty, they were all really pretty much amused by this. Um, many people believe that Beringer died penniless and devastated, but that has been disproven as well in other documents. In fact, he chose to fight back. He took them to court, and he won. <laughs> in court, they confessed, saying that they'd done it all because, and I quote, he was so arrogant and despised us all thus leaving themselves disgraced while he continued teaching for another 14 years and wrote two more books. <laughs> Still, history remembers Beringer not for, his embarrass or not for his accomplishments, but for the embarrassment. And it, it can't be denied that most of us really enjoy a really great practical joke, especially when the butt of it is an arrogant airbag. <laughs> It's schadenfreude at its finest. So the lying stones, as they are called, or Lugenstein in German, are now housed in various museums throughout Europe. And uh, this one, of a slug, can be found at Oxford University's Museum of Natural History. Now, clearly, this was an act of malice. However, such undertakings do not always have that intent. Case in point, a story that came out just last year. And I'm going to take a moment to ask for no spoilers, because some people in the audience know this story, and I'm going to ask that you just allow it to unfold so the rest of the audience can enjoy it. OK. So anyway, last year, an article came out in Artifacts, which is a British archaeology student publication out of the University of Wales, Trinity St. David. And that's how you say it in Welsh, and I'm not even going to try. Um, in the article, they talked about a Dr. Alwyn Pugh, and uh, how he and his wife, Dr. Odette Marks, were on a working holiday with their children, five-year-old Yeston and six-year-old Anwen. 
and they had gone to the Welsh island of Anglesey. Uh, there, Dr. Marx was collecting water and soil samples for the Welsh Department of Agriculture, and the children were playing around the base of an apple tree that had recently been uprooted in a violent storm. And Eston noticed something shiny. And he brought it to his father, and it was this copper pendant with tiny little pearls trapped under a damaged mica cover. And um, Dr. Pugh recognized the symbol on the back as being part of the Ogum uh, character series. So he brought it back to the university with him, secured a team of grad students. It took them a while, but they put together a team of grad students to go back to the site and excavate. And what they discovered was a small burial chamber with urns containing the ashes of five men and various artifacts. Uh, they were all on display for a short time last year. Most are now housed in private collections. There were several brass and glass rings, simple penannular brooches, uh, divination rods, coins, uh, various other items. There were also stones that were carved with ancient symbols such as triskelions and more Ogum characters like the one on the back of that first pendant that was found. Now, Ogum is a pre-Celtic writing system. It's kind of like Morse code. It's uh, mostly just simple dashes. And there are large stones carved in Ogum all over the UK. It took a team at the university months to decipher the messages because initially they thought that they were encoded Gaelic or Welsh, but they had finally figured out that it was Latin. And so they realized that some of the stones had names on them, but one stone in particular had a message that blew their minds. And it said, we renounce Rome and its Caesar. And it was determined that the remains and the items in that grave belonged to defected Roman soldiers who had converted to Druidism. So, because of the theme tonight, you all know this is malarkey. <laughs> but the question is, who did it? I mean, was it doctors Pugh and Marx? I mean, they look kind of sketchy. I'm thinking it was probably them, too. It, or it could have been a prank organized by the student magazine. I mean, who do you think did it? Do you think it was the doctors? Well, the answer is probably going to surprise a lot of you. Yeah, it was me. <laughs> this was a very well-researched exhibit of speculative historical fiction that I created last year for the Marvelous Strange Art Show that was curated and produced <laughs> by Annetta Black and Raven Ember, who is here somewhere in the room. So I made all that shit. The story, the magazine, all the artifacts, that was all me. Um, to come clean, Deb, who is a card-carrying member of the Magic Castle and a connoisseur of shenanigans, and her husband, Dave, are dear friends of mine from back home. They agreed to let me use their pictures. <laughs> And the children are actually my cousin's daughter, Anna, and my nephew, Jackson. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, I am an amateur metalsmith and writer and a semi-professional bullshitter. So this was, a, you know, something that was right up my alley. And with that, I would like us to raise our glasses. To schadenfreude, malarkey, and shenanigans, and our ability to recognize and appreciate a well-crafted hoax. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so
So Marvelous Strange was open for a month last year in uh, March, and I don't think, Raven, you can, you can check me here, but I don't think anyone realized that it was a hoax until Beth revealed it at the end of the exhibit. Um, I have the, the pendant that was in that first picture, and it is one of my cherished, cherished possessions. It's true. <laughs> It's all true. It's all true. No, yeah, it, it, it was a beautiful collection. It was a beautiful collection. All right, so we are going to take a cocktail break. I feel like everyone is ready for another cocktail. Before we go to that, I want to tell you a couple of important things. The first thing is, as many of you know, as I hope you're following along, we're building an Adventure Harvey map, and we're following Harvey's adventures. He's been everywhere this summer. We have our little Adventure Harveys that are created by our partner, uh, Isolde Honore, here. These wonderful little pocket-sized travel companions um, that have gone to all kinds of places. Uh, he's been hiking at Humbug Mountain, which is appropriate for this evening, has gone to a, a certain floating festival recently, done some cave exploration, played the odds and seems to be winning, met three different bears in one month, which I think is really impressive. That was a lot of bear action. Uh, went for a piggyback ride with a llama friend visited a mansion down south and admired a library. And I love these ones so much. Went to DEF CON in Las Vegas recently, where we unexpectedly had a quorum of oddlings and all of their Harveys, and that just makes me so happy. I can hardly believe it. Um, so if you would like to get your own Adventure Harvey, we first of all have our, our standard Adventure Harvey. We also have a special. We have a custom one for every single evening, which is also Amazing. Uh, tonight's is a little uh, Harvey, Harvey Mermaid, an extra chimera upon a chimera. Um, and if you take your Adventure Harvey on adventures and hashtag us with Adventure Harvey, we will follow along and grab your pictures and share them with everyone else. We will also be giving away one of these at the end of the intermission. So if you haven't filled out your raffle ticket yet, fill it out now, drop it off over at the merch table, and uh, we will... We will pull one out right afterwards. We also have um, glasses and our magnet sets and all kinds of other things over at the merch table and everything that you get there helps support us being able to do this here. So we really appreciate your purchases. We're gonna take a little break. When we come back, we will be looking at, uh, we'll, we'll be looking at things. We'll be looking at, um, uh, I lost it, it's okay. We have stories coming up. Oh, here we go. Uh, P.T. Barnum and the story of uh, the maps and mysterious islands and the story of history's greatest practical jokes that went horribly, horribly wrong. So join us after the break uh, for those things, about 10, 15 minutes. Oh, yeah, yeah. 